Noche de Transplantes es un espacio creado para ustedes, para la Asociación Colombiana de Transplantes, un espacio donde ustedes pueden discutir, conversar y pasar un momento agradable. Bueno, muy buenas noches tengan todos ustedes, sean bienvenidos a esta noche de trasplantes. En la noche de hoy tenemos un invitado muy especial, es el doctor Dorri Segep. El doctor Segep es profesor de cirugía de la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad Johns Hopkins. Es también profesor de, la, de epidemiología de la misma universidad y, y vicepresidente asociado del Departamento de Cirugía del Hospital Johns Hopkins. Además es fundador y director actual de la ERGOT. Eh, siglas en inglés que significan Grupo de Investigación en Epidemiología en Transplante de Órganos. Eh, el doctor Dorri Segev es un cirujano de trasplante abdominal que se enfoca en la cirugía de donante vivo mínimamente invasiva y en trasplante de órganos incompatibles. Mm, este, deseamos la Asociación Colombiana de Transplante de Órganos agradecer como primero a Euroética y su subdivisión de solución de preservación Belser de la Universidad de Wisconsin por la colaboración y gestión realizada en podernos permitir escuchar esta noche al doctor Segev. Desde ya, muchas gracias por todo. Es necesario mencionar que la Asociación Colombiana de Transplante de Órganos no tiene compromiso directo con ningún laboratorio, mantiene una posición neutral sin conflictos de interés y apoya a nivel científico todo lo relacionado con donación de órganos y trasplantes. Eh, antes de hacer la presentación del doctor Seguet, eh, voy a dar paso al doctor Aaron. Doctor Aaron, please, uh, I heard that you want to see any words, a few words uh, before I start uh, the conference of Dr. Seguet, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terrazona, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nino and the group in Colombia for hosting this Night of Transplants, we want to thank uh, your Etica, our uh, distribution. Me, Dr. Aaron, please, uh, on your video. Oh, thank you, yeah. Start with you, please, thank you. Yes. Is that better? Good. Yes, yeah, so just want to say thank you to, uh, to Dr. Terrazona, Dr. Nino, and all of you in Colombia for hosting the Night of Transplants. My name is Aaron Gilchrist. We are with Bridge to Life. We work in partnership with Euro Etica in distribution of preservation solutions and machines around the world, and particularly in Colombia with Euroetica. Uh, we were asked that Dory Segev could speak tonight. He's a wonderful speaker, uh, world, no, world renowned and, and a great living kidney transplant surgeon, but, but also doing many great things in terms of research um, for the future of transplant. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. And now we are going with uh, our, with uh, Dr. Uh, Doris Seguet. Good evening, Dr. Doris Seguet. Welcome to the Transplant Night. Uh, this is a space created by the Colombian Organ Transplantation Association with the aim of growing scientifically in this area of knowledge through conferences given by transplant specialists from around the world. Dr. Segev is a versatile person who not only dominates the field of transplant surgery and research, but also singing and dancing. That's right. <laughs> but tonight, we are going to attend your conference entitled Hot Topics in Organ Transplantations Today and Beyond. Please, Dr. Segev, can you start your talk? Great. Thank you, Christian. And, uh... Um, Aaron, for your support of this and for the invitation. Um, it's very nice to see some familiar names in the panel list and the attendee list. Um, I have enjoyed many visits to Colombia. Um, of course, we're always sad that this needs to be by Zoom instead of in person, but I'm very much hoping that um, soon the pandemic will start to uh, to improve and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to congregate in person again. Um, in fact, the last place I was outside of the United States right before the pandemic was in Colombia. So I guess it's only fitting 
um, I will share my slides and I um, am uh, 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 excited to uh, to have been invited to talk about some hot topics in organ transplantation, um, things that are hot today that will continue to be hot in the future. Um, and I was asked to address these four topics. Uh, COVID, um, we ta all we talk about today is COVID, so we will talk about COVID at the end. Um, we will also talk about artificial intelligence and um, how we can improve transplantation with new mathematical sciences. We'll talk about some uh, new work in ex vivo perfusion and a new uh, emerging field of frailty and um, the potential impacts of uh, under better understanding physiologic reserve. So we'll start with artificial intelligence. I'll just give you a definition that I like. Um, you hear the word artificial intelligence all the time. And so I see this as the science of getting computers to learn and act like humans do and to improve their learning over time by themselves in an autonomous fashion by feeding them new data in the form of real world observations. So they sense and they have reason and then they act and then they adapt based on what they've learned. In our field, there are three sort of major uses for artificial intelligence as I see them. One is, you know the question, you know how to answer the question, you just need the computer to do math quickly. We know this area of artificial intelligence very, very well. The second, which is becoming more interesting, is you know the question, but you don't know how to answer it. And you need the computer to explore different ways of how to answer it. And there's more and more work being done in this in the area of machine learning. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The last area, and this is the future, is you don't even know the question. You let the computer walk through all of the data that you have in your hospital and in your registry, and it tells you what are interesting questions. The whole area of machine learning, which is sort of what we do as artificial intelligence in medicine, can be split into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, are some of the things that we're used to. We're used to seeing regression models. So the hazard ratio of this, the odds ratio of this, the relative risk of this. Classification is one step higher where we use complicated regression models to make sort of better answers based upon larger groups of data. And then the other category that is gaining more sophistication is unsupervised learning where you give the machine the data and you let it explore the data. Um, things like neural networks, you hear about neural networks that help with diagnoses. All of those things are unsupervised learning. If we call the beginning of the decade the big data era, we are calling today now the machine learning era because be before machine learning's techniques needed to be um, uh, improved, we needed to have the data first. So we now have the data, and then we are further improving techniques for how to use the data. When you read a paper about machine learning, don't always assume that machine learning is helpful. Um, there are cases where machine learning is more hype than help. This is a study that we did where we took SRTR data, so national registry data, and we asked the question, would a traditional regression model perform any different from advanced machine learning models? And for this, the answer was no. And so we need to remember that for machine learning to be beneficial, we need better data, bigger data, and different questions. The questions that we are used to asking 
we can use traditional techniques for. And if we need to use more sophisticated techniques, it allows us to ask questions that we could not ask from a traditional technique. Across the entire board of what we can do with artificial intelligence, we can analyze outcomes. That's something we're quite familiar with. We can analyze risk factors. So we can say something like, what is the risk associated with crossing HLA barriers for a kidney transplant? Or what is the risk associated with a DCD liver for a liver transplant? We can do survival benefit analysis, which takes risk factor analysis to the next level. And it doesn't say, do I do better with an HLA compatible versus an HLA incompatible transplant? That's pretty easy. You're going to do better with the compatible. But a survival benefit analysis would say, do I do better with an HLA incompatible transplant or with the next best alternative? which is to wait for a compatible transplant. So survival benefit asks a real world question about what happens if I do this versus my other real world possibilities. We can use these techniques to identify preferred recipients. So there are interactions between donor factors and recipient factors. We know this clinically. We know that there are some organs that I can give some patients and they'll be fine. And if I give to some patients, they won't do well at all. For example, we've done studies of preferred recipients for older livers, preferred recipients for steatotic livers. And what we can do is we can identify some patients that don't mind the risk associated with the liver and some patients that for that patient, that liver is absolutely terrible. And we can use these analyses to identify preferred recipients. We can also use them for prediction. So not just saying, what is the risk associated with the DCD liver, but saying, if I put a 42-year-old DCD liver with one hour of warm ischemia time into a 35-year-old patient with a MELD score of 38, et cetera, what do I expect the mortality to be? the graft survival, the incidence of biliary complications, et cetera. And I can predict those based on the entire characteristics of the donor and recipient. We can also use them for clinical decision-making tools. So our patients every day get offered organs and they need to decide, do I accept this organ or do I reject this organ? If I accept this organ, there will be some survival. If I decline the organ and wait for the better organ, there will also be some impact on my survival. And we can help patients make these decisions in a data-driven way rather than just guessing. And then we can also use these techniques to study how we practice across maybe the entire country. So in the United States, we have 300 transplant centers. We can look and say, who is transplanting hepatitis C positive donors? Who is not transplanting hepatitis C positive donors? What are the outcomes? Is there a best practice? And can we take that best practice and teach other people that best practice? So many different applications for the emerging technologies of artificial intelligence. I'll just show you a simple one. This was done by Sanjay Bay in our research group to try to help kidney patients make a decision if you're a given patient who are, is offered a given donor, and you want to figure out if to take this or to wait, we will be able to tell you, based on the recipient and the, character, and the, the donor characteristics, what is the five-year survival if you get transplanted? What is the five-year survival if you, wait, uh, if you remain on the waiting list? And then the difference between those two is your survival benefit. So we can help people understand what the benefit would be or the harm if they took an organ versus waiting for a different organ. We can make things even a little bit more sophisticated. This was work that Eric Chow and my group did looking at infectious risk donor organs. These are organs that have a risk of an undetected HIV or hepatitis C infection. For example, 
injection drug users or something like that. And we can model all of the different possibilities that might happen to you if you get transplanted. And we can turn those models into an actual interactive calculator. So here you would enter the information about the recipient, you'd enter the, the information about the donor, and it would tell you if you accepted this organ, this is the predicted survival curve. And if you said no, this is the predicted survival curve. And bear in mind, if you said no, you might get a better offer tomorrow, and this incorporates all of that information. So for this patient, it's very easy to say, I should definitely take this organ, where, for example, for this patient, the outcomes are exactly the same if we transplant them or if we don't transplant them. And so they have you know, more of a emotional decision than a data-driven decision. Where do these data come from? We can collect data prospectively, but that's slow, expensive, there are errors. And the study population may not be representative of the entire country or the entire group that you're trying to study. We can go to a single center and we can look backwards. So the sample size is higher because we've transplanted many more people than we're transplanting in the future. So it's faster, but again, it still may be small because it comes from one center and the population may not be representative. We see now more and more multi-center studies where we take many centers, we look backwards, but again, there are burdens of sh data sharing and data protection and data in one center is kept in a different format than data in another center, et cetera. And still, if you get five or 10 centers together, you're not gonna get the same size as if you put all 300 centers in the United States together. And that's where registry data comes from. And that's what I call big data. This is data from across an entire transplant system. The problem with the national registry is the collection of data is quite limited. For example, in the US, we have data on hundreds of thousands of people, but we don't have cardiovascular risk factors on any of them because we've never collected that. So you are limited in the amount of data that you can collect feasibly, and there's no framework for collaborating outside of the registry. There is a new area of data science that I wanted to introduce you to called common data models. This lives in a bigger umbrella of what's called data harmonization. A common data model will organize data into a standard structure so that the given patient characteristic is represented in the same way on all systems. This way, institutions can share data easily, and the same analysis can be run on all of the data. To create a common data model, you need standardized tables to define how the data are organized. You need standardized concepts. These are building blocks of data records. So a concept may be a diagnosis or a procedure or a given drug or a given event or a visit or something like that. And then you need standard vocabularies. So these are collections of concepts. So an example of a vocabulary is the ICD-10 codes. These are the US diagnosis codes. And so that's an entire collection of diagnostic concepts. Once you've defined a common data model, you can apply federated learning. And this is really cool and really interesting. If I am working with 300 different transplant centers and each one has adapted their medical record to the common data model, I can run my analysis on every single, at every single center I don't ever have to see their data. They don't ever have to see my data, but I can run a statistical model that includes everybody's data, just like I could do if I had everybody's data. So this is a novel, very statistically clever way of gathering data from many, many sources without worrying about data privacy or other um, data use risks. The implications is that data collection is getting easier. We're able to pull data out of, um, out of electronic medical records more easily. That means there will be more data. There are more data every year. 
more sophisticated techniques will be possible and therefore more interesting scientific questions can be answered. There will still be challenges, but the more all of us as a medical community become familiar with these techniques, the better we can become. Switch topics to ex vivo organ perfusion. This is something that's been going on for quite a long time, particularly in some organs and emerging in other organs. These are examples of some of the currently available machines um, that have been tested and are in clinical use. Um, you can see here which ones are transportable. Some are large, some are small. Which ones oxygenate, which ones do not. Which ones are cold temperature, which ones are warm temperature. And then the kind of organs that are used in these, um, in these uh, uh, ex vivo perfusion systems. Um, there is uh, a new trial that, um, that uh, Bridge to Life um, that uh, uh, is represented by Aaron Gilchrist here today um, is bringing out um, their, new, uh, um, their new platform, their new technology. And if you're interested in their new technology, you can reach out to Euroetica, who is involved in this program today, um, to learn more about that. There is a trial now being planned um, for this new technology as well. So a number of different technologies at various levels of um, data and uh, um, evidence. There have been a few large scale or relatively large scale randomized trials. This is um, a recent paper looking at 220, um, 220 liver transplants using normothermic perfusion, um, where there was a decrease in graft injury, a decrease in discard, because remember, a machine not only perfuses the organ, but it gives you back information that you can use to decide whether the organ is viable. And it also allows longer preservation time for longer transports across larger countries and things like that. Um, hypothermic is another way of doing this, not just normothermic, but hypothermic is another way of doing this. This was, again, another um, relatively large, uh, uh, large scale trial showing um, uh, reduction of ischemia reperfusion injury in DBD livers, so donation after brain death, brain dead donor livers. And this was an art, another large study, um, very recent, showing the same thing in DCD, donation after cardiac death livers with improvement in ischemic cholangiopathy, hepatic artery thrombosis, primary non-function, and other injuries to the liver. There's a recent paper that took a very interesting approach, rather than trying to figure out is hypothermic better or normothermic better? They combined these two. This was in the Dutch system. When all Dutch liver transplant centers declined an organ, then they were offered for inclusion into this trial. Um, the machine perfusion approach that they used was first hypothermic oxygenated perfusion, then controlled oxygenated rewarming, and then normothermic perfusion. And here you see the temperature that they kept um, the organs at, as well as the, um, the hepatic artery and pulse and, and uh, portal vein pressures that they kept um, uh, in, on the machines. And they adjusted them as the temperature changes. They were able to get information back to decide if a liver was viable for transplantation. And of the seven livers that they put on this interesting pump, two of them were found to be non-viable, but five of them were found to be viable and got transplanted and all actually did quite well with nice decrease in ALT, nice decrease in bilirubin. There was a little transient increase in a couple of the recipients, which all returned to normal. And remember, 
these were all livers that were completely rejected across the entire Dutch transplant system and rescued, five out of seven were rescued through this system. That leaves us with cold storage, hypothermic and normothermic machine perfusion. And there are some differences. Cost is a bit different. Resource intensivity is a bit different. The personnel required are most uh, extensive for normothermic. If the device malfunctions, there's differences in the risk to the organ. Um, the operation of the pump is quite different across the different, um, uh, the different technologies. Normothermic gives you an extensive capability of evaluating the organ compared to hypothermic or even just cold storage. Um, and obviously the temperatures are, are quite different um, across these technologies. So this is still an area of investigation and growth, but with really exciting preliminary results that you can take organs that nobody else wanted to transplant and you can make them transplantable. Very exciting. I'll switch gears to talk about a little bit of lessons that we learned from a different field outside of transplantation. So if I ask you, who do you think will have better outcomes after a kidney transplant? A 42-year-old white woman with ESRD from hypertension or a 68-year-old white woman with ESRD from hypertension? Obviously, you would say the 42-year-old would have better outcomes. But what if I told you that the 42-year-old was frail and the 68-year-old was non-frail? What does that mean? And what implications does that have for their outcomes? Well, the frail person, despite being 26 years younger, will have a higher chance of being in the hospital for a very long time, will have twice the chance of being readmitted early after we already sent her home, and will have more than twice the mortality. So 26 years younger, but just because we mark her frail, her mortality is twice as high. <clears throat> How do we figure this out? How do we find measures that transcend comorbidity and age and truly measure physiologic reserve, truly quantify for us what we call the foot of the bed test, where you look at the patient and you're like, I don't think this person is going to do very well. Well, these lessons we learned from the geriatricians, they take care of people who are 90 years old and they need to figure out, will this 90 year old die if we do an operation or will they do okay? And they have demystified the concept of frailty into five clinical components. And if you have enough of these components, you are called frail. And in the geriatrics community, frailty is separate from comorbidity, which is independent from disability. So frailty is not just having heart disease. Frailty is not just having a disability. It is a separate measure of physiologic reserve that in older adults in the field of geriatrics is associated with poor outcomes, including mortality in this population. Well, why do we care about frailty and transplantation? First of all, older adults are comprising a higher proportion of those considering transplantation and those undergoing transplantation. And even younger adults look like older adults. So risk prediction is challenging, not just in the elderly, but in everybody. Chronologic age often does not equal physiologic age. And clinical decision-making, like is this person even a good transplant candidate? Which organ should we use in this person are very tough. And post-surgical management, like which immunosuppression should we choose for this person are also very challenging. Frailty is very prevalent in our patients. This orange is the percent that are frail and the gray is the percent that are pre-frail. -frail. And this is community dwelling adults over 65. In, in the community, if you take all people over 65, we would expect about 8% of them to be frail. 
if you take people on dialysis who are over 65, about 50% of them are frail. But interestingly, even if you take people under the age of 45 on dialysis, about 30% of them are frail. So we have many young people who are transplant candidates on dialysis, liver candidates with cirrhosis, et cetera. We see many, many, many frail people who are chronologically young, who are young age, but physiologically very old and debilitated. It turns out that frailty predicts all of the bad things after a transplant. Even among our candidates who are on dialysis, if you're frail, much higher risk of falls, much higher risk of hospitalization, much higher risk of mortality. When we transplant you, higher risk of delirium, higher risk of delayed graft function, higher risk of longer length of stay, higher risk of early hospital readmission, higher risk of some immunosuppression intolerance, higher risk of graft loss, higher risk of mortality. Each one of those was a separate study. We've studied this in about 10,000 patients. These are robust findings. Those who are frail have worse health-related quality of life as well. So if you're frail, you have a lower quality of life. As I told you, you also have worse cognitive outcomes in addition to worse physical outcomes. So it not only affects you physically, like your strength and your ability to recover from an operation, but it also affects you cognitively, like your risk of delirium or dementia after getting transplanted. Interestingly, when we transplant people, frailty will improve. And that is fantastic. That's very, very good news that what we do is useful. We actually improve people's physiologic reserve. The question is, if frailty is, if we can fix frailty before they get transplanted so that their outcomes can be better. We, we have, the field has moved from the concept of rehabilitation to the concept of prehabilitation. So instead of doing the operation and then trying to make things better, what if we do the operation after we've made things already better? In a very small randomized trial that we did, we found 64% improvement in physical activity in people who underwent a prehabilitation program. And interestingly, the Length of stay after a transplant in those people who participated in that randomized trial who got prehabilitation was half the length of stay as those who did not get randomized to prehabilitation. So it can even impact, directly impact outcomes of the, uh, of the transplant. We're continuing to understand frailty and to try to improve physiologic reserve. The topic that we all have been talking about for the last two years is COVID-19 has had a major impact on transplant patients across the world. Our patients have a higher risk of acquiring the disease because they're immunosuppressed and have higher prevalence of comorbidities, meaning higher risk of morbidity and mortality if they get COVID-19. What you're looking at here is excess deaths in the United States over the last year and a half for transplant patients. And we are seeing anywhere between a couple of hundred and almost a thousand excess people dying either directly from COVID or indirectly from COVID. So transplant patients are dying because of this pandemic. Those who are black and who are Hispanic in our population are dying at a higher rate than those who are white. And those who have private insurance are doing better than those who have government insurance. So in addition to an impact on our whole community, it is an impact that is felt most by underrepresented vulnerable populations. In December, the vaccines came out and we thought maybe the vaccines will be the answer that our transplant patients need. Well, one big problem is that patients on immunosuppression were excluded from the randomized trials that showed that the vaccines worked. Now, of course, a vaccine response requires an intact 
immune response and our patients are immunosuppressed. So in general, with all vaccines that we give our patients, there is a lower response. However, the COVID vaccines were a brand new platform using mRNA technology. Was this safe in transplant patients? And did this work? Did this create an immune response in transplant patients? And in December, we started to study this. We did a national study drawing from all the people in the United States who happened to be transplant patients and were also healthcare workers or other frontline people who were highest priority for the vaccines. By February, we had data on one dose. By April, we had data on 740 patients with two doses that was published in transplantation. We found that the safety was quite similar to the safety in the general population. Some side effects, as would be expected, local, systemic. No evidence of an increase in acute rejection or other impacts to the allograft. So we were very early able to get the word out to transplant patients all around the world that the vaccine would be safe for them. But of course, does it work for them? And as early as March, we were able to publish in JAMA based on hundreds of patients that there was a problem, that antibody was only detectable in less than 20% of transplant patients. And those even who had antibody had very low levels of antibody. When you compare this to people in the general population, it was truly shocking. 100% of people in the randomized trials had high levels of detectable antibody after their first dose of an mRNA vaccine. Only 20% of transplant patients had any detectable antibody, and the levels were actually quite low. So very frightening for transplant patients. Those on anti-metabolites, really, really almost impossible to get an antibody response after one dose. And those who were older had a worse antibody response. So those who were further out from their transplant had a better antibody response, presumably because they were taking less immunosuppression. And interestingly, the Moderna platform seemed to be much better for transplant patients than the Pfizer platform. Of course, when we sent dose one to JAMA in March, they said, please send us dose two data, because obviously the recommendation is two doses. And so we did. Um, one month later, we had dose two data. And sure enough, things got somewhat better, but still not very good for transplant patients at all. Still about half of transplant patients have no detectable antibody and about one quarter of them have relatively low detectable antibody. What you're looking at here, two different testing platforms. You see in blue, the ones who had some response to dose one, many of them boost to a relatively high level by dose two. But if you had no response to dose one, most people were either negative or had a relatively low response to dose two. So still problematic for more than half of transplant patients, still suboptimal protection, at least as measured by antibodies. Still problematic with anti-metabolites, better for those who are further out, better for those who got Moderna. Remember, we talked about machine learning and how machine learning can in an unsupervised way, take a whole bunch of different risk factors and say, these are the important ones, these are the not important ones. And so what we did is without any predetermined um, uh, opinions, we put all of the data into a machine learning model. And it told us that being on MMF was the most important predictor. How far you've been from your transplant and your age are the other two most important predictors. And all of the other things, have a relatively low value of prediction. Now, of course, we were just looking at antibodies. Do antibodies really mean anything? Well, we've subsequently looked at neutralization capacity in our patients as well. The ability to neutralize pseudovirus through the ACE2 assay and the ability to neutralize actual live virus, looking at wild type and the various variants of concern, including the Delta variant. And it turns out that in our patients, in transplant patients, the higher your antibody levels are, the more likely you are to have neutralization capability. And of course, neutralization is what gives you protection. 
Now, in people with normal immune systems that participated in the randomized trials, we can even take that further and we can say that antibody levels correlate with neutralization, which also correlates with clinical protection. So in the big 30,000 patient trial, both antibody levels and neutralization levels were correlated with the risk of getting a clinical COVID-19 infection. So for every tenfold increase in your level, you had about a third of a decrease in your risk of getting a clinical infection. And that's really important. We also saw some indirect evidence of this in transplant patients. So when we studied 18,000 transplant patients across 17 hospitals, we found that a fully vaccinated transplant patient has 82 times higher risk of a breakthrough infection than a fully vaccinated person from the general population and has 485 times higher risk of a breakthrough infection with associated hospitalization or death. So much higher risk of breakthroughs in vaccinated transplant patients because they are not fully protected. There is a clinical correlation to what we're seeing when we're measuring antibodies. Well, Early on, you know, in the United States, patients just started taking third doses when the data came out that two doses were not sufficient. And by June, we were able to publish very early results, which we've since updated, showing that people do better if we give them three doses of the vaccine than if we give them two doses. If after two doses, they were low positive, they all boost to high positive. And even those who were negative after two doses, about half of them start to show an antibody response, and about a third of them show a high positive antibody response. So third doses are very important for our patients. And this was subsequently confirmed in big reports from France and in a randomized trial from Canada as well. And we sent our data to the FDA and CDC, who authorized third doses for people who are immunocompromised. What you're looking at here are the, ant the actual antibody levels for patients who got third doses. The orange lines are the ones who started low positive. The blue lines are the ones who started negative. You see that some of them will reach a high enough level of antibody that correlates with neutralization and probably correlates with clinical protection. But there are many transplant patients still after three doses that don't get good immune protection. Some of them have started taking fourth doses on their own. We've studied this, and we still see encouraging data that even if you fail three doses, you may succeed in a fourth dose. But this is observational, real-world data, not in a randomized trial. Fortunately, we caught the attention of Anthony Fauci at the NIH, who has funded us many millions of dollars to create several randomized trials. One of the randomized trials will be to look to see, do you need with an additional dose to reduce immunosuppression in order to get an effect? And is it safe to do so? And the other randomized trial is to test the difference between homologous boosting with the same platform versus heterologous boosting with a different platform. The current discussions that are ongoing are we do see improvement with additional doses, so those should be made available to people. However, some people do not have enough immunity, even with multiple doses of the vaccines, and they will need other immunity strategies like passive immunity from monoclonal antibodies. And one of the things we're discussing now is whether monoclonal antibodies should be available as pre-exposure prophylaxis for our patients. There's also been a strong movement in the United States to require vaccination prior to transplantation, and there's strong rationale for this. The vaccine response pre-transplant before you start immunosuppression is much better. There are very low chance of a good vaccine response early post-transplant. There are high death rates with breakthrough infections. In transplant patients, we've shown that breakthrough infections are associated with a 10% mortality. That's very high. 
And then programmatically, particularly in the United States, we flag centers that don't have good outcomes. And if their patients are dying from COVID, they will get flagged and they will have programmatic problems. And there's obviously a strong precedent for many other mandates in transplantation. There's no reason we can't mandate vaccination as well. There is an interesting implication for the future. I want to point out that we ran a research study of 8,000 people across a country that spans 5,000 miles, and we never met any of our study participants in person. Everything was done from home. We interviewed them from home. We did blood draws from home. And this has major implications on the future of longitudinal high dimensional surveillance, both for research and for clinical practice. And if you ask me what is the best thing that comes from this pandemic, the best thing is that we've learned how to interact with people without requiring them to come into a hospital where we can study them, we can monitor them, we can treat them very, very effectively. Um, Thank you for your time and for your attention. This is my research group at Johns Hopkins, the Epidemiology Research Group in Organ Transplantation. Every single person named on these slides have contributed to the data that I showed you and to the studies that we're doing. And I'd like to acknowledge all of their incredibly hard work um, in bringing science forward and in helping move, move our field forward and make things better for transplant patients. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seget, for your interesting lecture. Many ideas, I am really sure that many ideas and reflections arise due to, to this interesting topic. Next, we will give uh, a space for the questions uh, of the attendees. So, uh, Dr. Nino. Uh, um, talking about frailty of the patients, uh, definitely, we, when we evaluate the patient until we transplant them, so many years we can uh, run. So how can we work on the long run to, to not have more frail patients at the uh, transplant moment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we are starting to see that if we Let's say, let's take kidney as an example. We have patients who are on dialysis, right? They come to dialysis three times a week. We can do small but important things for them to improve their frailty and improve their physiologic reserve. For example, one of the things we do is we put a small bicycle peddler right next to their dialysis machine. And if they use that peddler more than half an hour during a dialysis session, they improve their frailty over time. We give them iPads where they do cognitive games. And if they use the iPad more than half an hour on dialysis, they improve their cognition and they don't have this reduction in cognitive function that you typically see long-term with dialysis. So we can improve our patients prior to the transplant and then we can make better transplant decisions, make sure that we don't give higher risk organs to people who won't be able to tolerate those higher risk organs. And so we can use what we know about physiologic reserve to make organ offer decisions. And then after the transplant, we can continue as rehabilitation to continue to improve them physically and cognitively. Uh, Dory, how often do you reevaluate your patients on the waiting list? So some who are in very good shape, we don't do very often at all. And then the ones that we worry about, we will reevaluate between every six to 12 months. Thank you, Dory. Eh, si alguien tiene una pregunta, por favor, eh, por el chat o, o alguna manera por hacernos saber. Eh, Cristian, ¿tú tienes alguna pregunta? Gracias, doctor Niño. Eh, sí, 
uh, okay, Dr. Sikev, it's, 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 uh, it's a question about the preservation solutions. Uh, what do you think, what is the future about the, the preservation solutions? Uh, and my question is in relation about the, there is a new kind of machines, mechanism machines that uh, is probably to make a substitution of these uh, preservation solutions. Yeah, it's a, a very good question. I think ultimately there are some organs that are fine. They're good organs. They've got no problem. We know that they're going to work. We have short cold ischemia time. The recipient is there in the operating room. We don't, it doesn't matter what you do with that organ. Cold preservation, whatever solution you choose, it will be fine. As risk increases, these things become more and more important. And they become more important from two perspectives. One is the impact that the preservation has on the organ. So, for example, I have seen livers that I would never touch, that when they go on these pumps, they actually improve. They improve in the appearance. They improve in the the characteristics, the flow characteristics, et cetera. The most amazing demonstrations of this is in lung. You see lungs really not inflating and looking terrible, and they can completely resuscitate these lungs using machine perfusion. So the impact on the organ is important, and then the impact on our decision-making. So I don't just look at a liver and grossly, or maybe with a small biopsy, try to figure out if this is transplantable or not, but I get information back about how the liver is responding, how the kidney is responding, how the lung is responding to the pump, the resistance, the flow patterns, the other biomarkers that are in the perfusate, and I can make a much more educated decision about whether this graft that I probably would not have ever used without this technology that I will be able to use. And I think that that's really an important area in moving forward with these, uh, these perfusion machines is organs that we, we're not sure what to do with this thing. And we get so much more data when we put it on a perfusion pump, in addition to the advantage that it actually improves the organ. We have a question from Dr. Andres Becerra from Medellin. He asked, how do you uh, measure frailty and how often do you measure in the patients in your waiting list? So um, I showed a slide, but th there are there's a wide literature on frailty. Um, the frailty has five clinical components and you measure those five clinical components. Let's see if I can find the slide so we can we can look at this while we talk about it. Um, where here it is. Um, if I share with you, you will be able to see the this slide. So I'm not in presentation mode, but you should be seeing the slide here. And these are the components. And you actually ask about unintentional weight loss. You use a grip strength device to measure their grip strength and you adjust that for gender and BMI. You ask them two questions from the depression scale. You do a time activities questionnaire to see if they have low physical activity. And then you make them walk 15 feet three times and you see how fast they can walk and whether their walking is slowed down. And you add up all of those things and if they have three or more of those characteristics, they're considered frail. Um, We've, if you look at our pa frailty patients, we have a lot more detail on exactly how to do this. And there's an entire frailty kit now that's available from the American Society of Transplantation adapted um, from this. Now, I will say that this is what's called the physical frailty phenotype. It was developed in the geriatrics population. It was not developed in transplant patients. There are probably better ways to measure this in transplant patients, but nothing has been validated in a transplant patient beyond what already exists um, in the literature for frailty. How often should you measure it? I would measure it at least initially 
so you know where the patient is starting. If the patient is one you worry about, I would measure it more frequently. If it's one you worry less about and you, when you call them, they seem to be doing just fine and they haven't had any major changes, I don't think you need to measure it that frequently if you don't have that many worries. For people that you're really worried, you should be doing prehabilitation. And obviously, if you're doing that, then you should be um, monitoring them much more carefully. So well, there is another question here on the chat is, what are the ethical implications of the use of inter inter artificial intelligence on organ transplantation? So the ethical implications depend on what you use it for. For example, if I'm helping a patient make a clinical decision of whether to accept an organ or decline an organ, I'm adding data to a conversation that we've already had that we could have without the data, but we have a better conversation with the data. So ethically, that's not that big of a deal. If I'm doing research and I'm trying to figure out some biology mechanism in transplantation and I explore this with machine learning, not a big ethical situation. What becomes ethically challenging is when you use these kind of AI techniques to determine who lives and who dies. When you use them in allocation policies, that becomes tricky. And I will tell you that we had many debates about this in the United States. There used to be 15 years ago when we were talking about fixing the kidney allocation system, there was an, a, a relatively simple but still artificial intelligence based allocation system that was proposed. And everybody felt like AI is great for personal decisions, but when you start to make policy decisions based on that, you really have to be sure that the AI is doing a good job and no one was really sure that the AI was doing a good job. And so it didn't end up being the thing we use for allocation. So I think we just have to be more careful when we use these techniques to decide who lives and who dies. Is, uh, there is another question here. Uh, can you uh, use your algorithms uh, with the Colombian population? Um, so we have many algorithms. <laughs> so the, <laughs> some, of the, some of these I think will translate and some will not. I think when we think about, okay, here was a study done in the U.S. population. What can we learn from it for the Colombian population? You could say, well, we could look at, you know, people in the U.S. who are marked Hispanic, and we could then try to look at Hispanic patients in the U.S. and say, well, maybe they're, you know, similar to Hispanic patients, to people who live in Colombia. But that's, you know, being Hispanic and in the United States can mean you're from one of 50 different countries, and it also is generally associated with other social determinants of health and cultural issues and things like that. So I think we need to think about the biology of what, what algorithms you're thinking about and whether that biology is different in people who live in Colombia, who you are taking care of, versus people who live in the United States. And I think if there are no biological differences, then they, general, they translate very easily. And if there are biological differences, you need to think about the implications for those on how to translate the, the algorithms. Okay, I think we, there are 60 minutes and I think we are done. Thank you very much, Dory. And remember that uh, you have already the invitation to come to Colombia. We have to go to the coffee axis as we talked uh, last time in Baltimore. <laughs> so uh, maybe the next talk can be uh, not a virtual talk, but, but a present talk. That would be amazing. Thank you, um, Dory. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you to everyone, um, friends and colleagues, and uh, um, very much looking forward to future interactions and discussions and moving our field forward. Thank you, Dr. Dory. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. Um, okay, in the absence of questions, we end uh, our transplant night. Um, thanks once again 
the participation of Dr. Doris Agev. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Doris.